and welcome. My name is Julie Katz and I'm the Wash U Miami Network Chair. I've been an alumni volunteer working with the Wash U Alumni Association to plan events and engagement for South Florida alumni and parents for over 14 years now. I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar featuring Bob Schneiderman, Olin graduate of 1985 and Scott Field, Olin MBA graduate of 1994. Now, before we begin, I'd like to explain the format for today's session. Bob and Scott will each present for 10 minutes and then jump into a joint discussion based on the questions you submitted during registration. We will also have time to take additional questions over the last 15 minutes of this one hour event. Please ask any additional questions in the chat box. The webinar is being recorded and we will share it on the Alumni Association YouTube channel and on the website following this event. It is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome both Bob Schneiderman and Scott Field. Bob is an executive managing director at Colliers International, specializing in advising tenants and occupiers on their commercial real estate matters. He has an extensive background in working with both local, national, and global corporations. Scott is currently focused on commercial and residential real estate sales and on emerging technology. He has extensive experience in leadership, public speaking, transactional real estate and business consulting, entrepreneurial business, sales and marketing, and operations. Bob, I'll let you start us off today. Sure, thanks, Julie. So the purpose of this virtual alumni spotlight event is to provide you with some current trends and information relative to what's happening in the commercial and residential real estate markets. I'm going to cover the commercial real estate side, and then we're going to turn it over to Scott to talk about the uh, residential side. So in the face of four potentially large crises occurring in the same year, health crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, and now we social crisis, it's more important than ever for individuals and companies to have a plan. We've seen companies and individuals get in trouble without having such a plan and making some rash decisions. Having a well thought out plan will greatly enhance a firm's odds for success. In dealing with such massive uncertainty, a plan is one of the things that can possibly help guide you. Therefore, it's certainly worth the effort. A good re-entry plan should cover a couple of important points. How to re-enter the workplace safely and protect the health and well-being of the employees and owners, and key changes to the workplace going forward. Here, here are the six main points um, my discussion is going to cover today. An overview of the commercial real estate markets, the impact of social distancing on office space, items to consider prior to re-entering, Workplace of the future and what changes owners and tenants should implement, results from work from home study, and re entry recommendations. So, if everyone's set, let's get started. Um, given the format of today's virtual session, my plan is to touch these items briefly and then turn it over to Scott before we open it up to QA on, at the end. So, first slide. Let's talk about what's going on in the commercial real estate markets. Pretty much no matter what city you put in front of the conversation, uh, deal velocity is down. There's, there's so much uncertainty out there. Most companies are really trying to um, avoid making long-term decisions and many are deferring uh, things and, and doing a lot of short-term um, stopgap measures. Rates are certainly expected to decline as defaults increase and the vacancy rates rise. As I mentioned, tenants are looking for a lot of shorter term solutions. Real space needs are also decreasing. Industry standards are being reevaluated. Um, a lot of press has been recent about firms not reopening right away, many firms even already deferring until 2022. We're also seeing a shift from a lot of clients uh, looking to newer buildings with smart features and, and touchless entries. Lastly, HVAC systems, air conditioning systems, will need to be readdressed or modified in order to get people confident and comfortable going forward. And lastly, uh, there's a lot of different people that have uh, opinions about this, but I, I would say office space is not going away. Companies can instill culture without having a, a space and, and a belonging. And we're going to miss a lot of innovation and collaboration without having um, people working together. So I really don't think office is going away. It's just going to be 
different going forward. So let's go to the next topic, impact of social distancing on office space. The world is gonna be a different place going forward. Old habits from the past like shaking hands, large team and group meetings, retreats and conferences, or folks just hanging around by the break room or copier are gonna to need to be changed in order to move forward safely. If people don't make changes like more frequent hand washing or stop being too close to each other and modify some behaviors, we're gonna require further dire actions. We need to be thoughtful about getting back to work. Companies are going to need to create a culture of cleanliness and lead by example. Building owners can address additional janitorial measures for the building, but business leaders need to determine how to incorporate this into their space. Here are some examples of what likely going to change. What people wear. You're probably going to see masks as the new norm. People might wear gloves and possibly different materials that don't harbor um, bacteria and other items. How we work is going to be different. Densely populated plans of the past will soon change. Industry is now looking at um, square footage per person ratios. Those are certainly changing as well. And how we interact together is probably going to be different. Even though more people may start going back to the office over time, there may be less in-person meetings. We might continue with more virtual meetings like this one. All right, let, next slide. Let's go on to the third topic. What's needed prior to going back to work? In, in this new world, change is necessary to move forward safely. If people jump the gun like we did already and return to work full time before it's safe, uh, we might end up making things worse and create additional problems for ourselves and setbacks for the economy. Here are some key points that um, I've gathered on numerous Zoom calls with global tenants, architects, and others. And some of these tenants include Nestle, Nokia, PepsiCo, Cisco, DHL, and Oracle. Employee behavior is going to change. Many people are uneasy about returning. Some are even depressed. And the new buzzword this week is anxiety, especially with school starting. Anxiety is increasing um, for a lot of people. The way we work is going to change. As I said before, a sea of densely populated cubicles and benching is likely going to be gone. Square footage ratios per person have, have been compressed. People are trying to cram more and more people into spaces to see. More than likely, that ratio is going to go back up and possibly even something close to 250 square feet per person. And a vaccine should become the norm over time, but both are certainly have our control and being developed and take time. And this may not fully eradicate the problem as some people may not even want to get vaccinated. Thermal cameras may be installed and people may see those at buildings to measure visitors or employee temperatures at entrances and thermometers will likely be in reception areas. I, I know we have one at a table outside in our reception area and it's gonna be likely the norm for a while. You're gonna see an offering of PPE equipment to employees, masks, gloves, removing chairs in conference rooms and, and closing break rooms temporarily. That's likely something that we've recommended to some of our clients and it's something that's happening today. When you have workstations and, and, and employees in the open area, um, people are removing workstations so people aren't as close to each other, staggering the stations so they don't face each other, staggering the workforce, letting the critical workforce come back first so you don't have everybody in, in at once. Adding signage to remind people to wash their hands and even directional signage on floors for spacing and having people go in one direction so you don't uh, cross up as you're walking around in the office. There's also gonna be an emphasis on touchless, touchless sinks, touchless soap, doors, elevators, lights. You've also might have seen brass pointing devices that people are selling, which are antimicrobial, unlike aluminum that harbor a virus to help you push buttons and open doors. Let's go to the fourth topic, workplace of the future and what changes owners will need to implement. As I mentioned, both employee behaviors and the way we work is going to change. Certainly landlords that get this will be in a much better position to retain tenants and attract new ones. However, they can't charge 100% of the cost of some of these items that they need to do today 
and raise the operating expenses of a building because everyone is struggling right now and businesses are off and if landlords start raising prices in, in, in a market where we need things to go down, they're gonna have an exit and they're gonna start getting uh, empty buildings. So th there's a lot of pressure on rates right now. Rates, rates locally have been escalating pre-pandemic and right now there's a lot of pressure on rates to come down, although real estate is a lagging indicator and unfortunately they're not gonna decline as quickly as they, as they went up. Uh, so some of the key changes we're gonna see is automation. And Scott and I will touch on this a little bit later as well, but you're gonna see some touchless entries. There's something called nanoseptic stickers, self-cleaning stickers, it's more occupancy sensors. There's a company called Intelliglass, which is an innovator here, and they have sensors in ceilings and walls. And we're gonna see buttonless elevators and you can certainly expect to hear more about these items. Some of these already exist in larger markets, but you're gonna see them appear in smaller markets as well where it makes sense. New antibacterial and antimicrobial products will be introduced, foggers, UV light disinfection, spray microshield 360 is a product that even airlines is, are using in, in their planes to disinfect. Enhanced building janitorial and company specific cleanliness items like sanitation stands will be integrated into the workplace. You heard a lot about green materials a while back. Green materials don't have the same ability to clean like hospital sanitizers. So people and buildings are now getting away from some of the green materials, which is another issue. Work surfaces are gonna be replaced. Some older porous work uh, surfaces will be replaced with seamless workstations. A lot of the manufacturers of furniture are already working on this. Plexiglass is popping up everywhere. You go to a bank, you go to a restaurant, offices, uh, receptionist, uh, doctor's office, you're going to see a lot of plexiglass. Soft, comfortable cheating, uh, seating that can um, harbor pathogens will be replaced with hard, wipeable surfaces. And workstations uh, will have storage on the top to encourage employees not to put their uh, stuffed personal belongings on the floor. Let's go up to the fifth topic. So work from home, you know, it, it's still undetermined how many folks truly enjoy working home, from home after all this time, but we know people certainly want to work from home at least part of the time. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how, how this plays out. If, if, you, if you have the ability on your screen, there's a reaction button on the bottom. I'm curious how many people are going into their office at least one or two days a week consistently. If someone can just click on the reactions and maybe give me a thumbs up if you're going into the office one or two days a week just to get an idea of how many people. The majority of people as we've seen so far are still not comfortable going in full time. And it's kind of interesting uh, to see what the numbers look like. So next slide, please. You know, many companies are gonna be able to reduce some of their office space spend, which is a big deal as real estate is generally the second largest expense item and other companies are gonna to have to decentralize to make sure they're safe. But here are a few points that um, we identified. So we, we've surveyed over 4,000 people to date and it's no surprise to me that around 75, 70 to 75% wanna work from home at least one day a week. Next slide, please. However, there's still a work-life uh, work balance that becomes more challenging. Uh, next slide. Some folks need more collaboration. Uh, the younger generation seems to struggle more with this work from home experience based on a lot of the studies so far. There are issues with socialization, connectivity, um, productivity and focus, and maintaining or creating a culture. I mean, can you imagine hiring somebody new, bringing them into your organization, help trying to get them to adapt or feel part of, the, part of the organization. It's a real challenge today. Um, next slide, please. There, there's also compliance issues with some companies, uh, licensing issues, HIPAA regulations, software licenses. Um, so, you know, in, in order to return back to work, people definitely need a strategy or a plan to get the workplace ready. Next slide, please. So, you know, the things that people are missing, in-person contact, spontaneous meetings, uh, you know, just normal social interactions. Next slide. Um, like I said, having, having the plan is gonna be key. 
don't just do this ad hoc because there's a lot of things that need to be done and, and, and there's a lot of serious implications by not doing the right, the right things. Next slide, please. So pe people are gonna go back, but they expect the worst place to be different. They, need, they wanna see more spacing, more cleaning, more stricter sick policies, flexible hours, less desk sharing, increased support. Um, workplaces need to adapt for each situation because there's not one size that fits all for each employee and for each company. Next slide. Everyone has a stiff, uh, def different set of challenges and issues. And there's gonna be a, a, a lot to take into account pre-vaccine and reimagine future post-vaccine. Next slide. We have health, wellness, and safety issues are all gonna be a priority. New information is coming out daily and there's certainly a focus on hygiene and distancing. Next slide, please. New guidelines are emerging, as I mentioned earlier, and a shift from highly dense, densely populated space to you know, less dense and, and, and a little bit safer. Next slide. So let's look, one more, please. And one more. Okay, so lastly, um, many landlords and tenants are still unclear about all the steps necessary for re-entry. Collier's is one of the largest global commercial real estate firm, and we are positioned as a resource and advisor to help these companies as we manage over 2 billion square feet. So right now, we've put together a bunch of re-entry recommendations, and I wanna highlight some of these things so you all can see some of the things that are happening and understand what's going on. Um, you know, lately a lot of the smaller firms and people that were self-managing are getting uncomfortable and they're unable to get a lot of the resources that are needed in light of what's going on. And it's, it's crazy what's happening. And we've picked up over 20 million square feet in the last 75 days. Um, next slide, please. So we're, we're, I'm just gonna roll through a few of the pictures and show you, but a couple of the things to think about. I heard a story that in, in a major market, um, some people are gonna need a reservation to go up and down the elevator. I heard a colleague in Atlanta took an hour and a half to get out of a building. You know, elevators are being restricted, not too many people going up and, and down at the same time. And, and can you imagine waiting over an hour to get out of a building in an elevator? So, it, it, you know, stairwells are gonna be one direction, except in the case of an emergency, one way up, one way down. And next slide. I also heard a story in China in the beginning when the virus first appeared, they shut off the air conditioning to stop the spread. But obviously down here in South Florida, shutting off the air conditioning is, is not an answer. Um, there, there's a lot of discussion with air conditioning safety, and I'll get to that in a minute when we see the slide, but you can see some examples of what you're gonna see more, people cleaning and wiping down surfaces, um, signage, and, and, and directing people how to get in and out of places safely. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. There's an example of an elevator. Can you imagine walking into an elevator facing the wall and, and you know, stopping? It, it's some of these things we, we never would have imagined in our lifetime would have happened, but it, it's something we have to think about today. Next slide. You'll see workstations eliminated, the way people were sitting, plexiglass dividers between uh, stations and tables. Next, doors, leaving doors open in meetings, um, virtual meetings instead of in-person meetings. Next slide. Again, uh, signage, directing people what to do and, and, and just making sure people are cognizant and don't forget. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These nanoseptic stickers are kind of interesting if you read about them. They're, they're actually self-cleaning and they can be replaced. Next slide. Automated stations, less attendance. Next slide. One more. Okay, I wanna to just touch on this briefly. So this is something that is a concern of mine, but air conditioning. So. There's, there, there's still studies going on to figure out um, what is the right and best way. There's different trade associations that are looking at this as well, but certainly um, the type of filters in your building and in your air conditioning system, um, 
writing, uh, nothing is conclusive yet, but my understanding is there are certain materials that can kill the pathogens and stop the spread. And you just need to be conscious of this and understand that buildings will do certain things, but not all things. And this is something that's important to consider asking your landlord what changes they made to their building, to their air conditioning system. I certainly asked my landlord this and, and, and they've done steps, not enough in my opinion, but they have taken some steps and it is a move in the right direction. But the majority of air conditioning systems are designed with non-HIPAA or UV light filtration. And to retrofit this stuff is all expensive and there are a lot of different things that are being explored and some people are even considering putting a HIPAA filter in their own personal office. Unfortunately, um, I didn't have enough time to take a deeper dive into a lot of this subject matter. I wanted to give you an overview and highlight a few things to think about. And they'll pass along my email address at the end. Certainly, you can feel free to contact me, and I'd be happy to um, get back to anybody. But at this point, I want to turn it over to Scott so he can address some of his matters, and then we can certainly um, answer some questions and, and, and go from there. So Scott, take it away. Okay, well, Bob, it's obvious I sit at the feet of a master. Um, happy to be here, we've got a great turnout. Uh, I'm just going to try to breeze through a lot of slides in a relatively short order. So up front, same offer if anybody wants to pick up this conversation with me going forward, afterward, and certainly Bob and I will entertain questions and have some fun with the, uh, with the audience as we uh, conclude our individual presentations. So I thought I would start off just kind of looking at the dissonance that exists in our world today and uh, we can roll forward. So we've got headlines that are really kind of competing, right? Um, unemployment, we've got tens of millions of people out of work and yet housing demand is greater right now, sales are greater, pending sales are greater than they were a year ago. How can those two things juxtapose in the same moment? Um, we can go to the next slide. So South Florida, of course, is heavily affected. Most economies are. South Florida, particularly because our economy is so heavily influenced by the tourism sector, the hospitality sector, um, Construction also, which that's slowed down, maybe not as much as the other two, but hospitality and um, tourism are really, really detrimentally impacted by the, the current health crisis. So we have that article on the left. Uh, we, we're having this, this uh, plunge in our GDP. And then the article on the right says, uh, COVID's not taking a toll on real estate deals, again. A lot of dissonance in perspective there. We can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we're dealing with and have been for quite some time, this has been the lament and I think on Bob's side is in fact I'm sure on I say Bob's side but on the commercial side as well, um, lack of inventory. Inventory levels have been tight for a number of reasons uh, including just the fact that property owners are holding on as people often do maybe a little later than they should, um, but people have been clinging to their inventory. And now, of course, on the residential side, even if you're thinking about selling your place, do you really want strangers coming into your home if you're occupying the home? Uh, not a comfortable thing when you're concerned about uh, infection from a potentially deadly disease. On the other side, Interest rates are, and many in our audience, I'm guessing, can remember when interest rates were several multiples of their current levels. Um, so we have um, money that is really cheap by historical standards. There is an inverse correlation between interest rates and pricing, uh, particularly on residential real estate because um, people are payment sensitive. So if interest rates are low, payments uh, can be low on a higher property value. Um, so people are pretty motivated by that. Certainly the refi business right now is exploding. 
We can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, lenders are starting to slow down. They're reading the headlines. Obviously, there is some risk in the near future in terms of an economic decline. Um, we're starting to see more indications of that. Um, we're not certainly going to enter into politics here, but it is a, a fact that the government has pumped trillions of dollars into the economy to keep it afloat, and that money has um, made us pretty liquid. Um, we're currently experiencing a lag in that uh, people, there are people, tens of millions, who are now about two weeks behind on the $600 a week payment that they were receiving as a um, uh, federal subsidy on top of their state unemployment. My concern as per the headline on the right is uh, that that uh, lag in income could be some of the push to get the avalanche moving downhill. We'll see. Uh, next slide, please. So <laughs> I pulled up this article uh, I think this was from Florida Realtors, um, National Association of Realtors, that, uh, you know, I mean, it's pretty rosy, really. The 4% increase in GDP, home sales up 7%, new home sales up 16%. Um, my sense is that's all a function of how much of an effect um, the pandemic has on the economy and how quickly we can recover. I personally see that as being very optimistic. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's really driving demand in South Florida is uh, people from the Northeast, forgive me, I, I warned that um, my dog might start barking in the middle of this and she is. Is that, you folks can hear Julie, Bob, is it bad or not? Okay. So, so um, Bob slides demonstrating, you know, what it's like to use an elevator. Imagine, and some of you probably are from the city, um, imagine living in a, a crowded condo and having to deal with a crowded elevator every day and then hearing from relatives in South Florida who are walking among the palm trees. Uh, we're getting a lot of demand from the Northeast currently, and a lot of our current sales are being driven by that exodus from the Northeast. Now, whether that's um, a long-term trend, to some degree, for sure, the demographics indicate that the baby boomers are coming from the Northeast to South Florida. Um, this current exodus from the pandemic lockdown, whether that will be a lasting effect, remains to be seen. On the other side of it, um, people here in Florida are feeling the impact more. Uh, you know, the direct impact to our economy, economy is significant and um, local uh, consumer uh, attitudes are becoming more pessimistic. Next slide, please. So something that happened in the last recession and Bob and I have touched on this a little bit, you know, we're getting a bit of a sense of deja vu from the last recession. Um, institutional investors for the first time last recession entered into residential housing on a one-off basis. So the Blackstone Group, a huge equity firm, was buying up single housing units, condos, single family homes, where before institutional money always went into apartment complexes, 100 units or more typically. Now we see some investment into individual units. Um, Invitation Homes was purchased by Blackstone. They just recently sold. Apparently they have a big war chest that they're planning to invest and likely there will be a lot of opportunity to um, purchase distressed property in the coming year or two. Next slide, please. 
So Bob touched on working from home. Uh, you're going to see that impact residential real estate in some ways because people are going to be thinking about living, you know, spending more time in their homes. They, there will be more impact on home design to allow for working space. Um, people may consider commutes less and there may be a migration. We can go to the next slide. Maybe a migration toward more uh, rural living uh, because people won't necessarily have to live in cities to do their work, even if their employer is in the city. Um, some impacts on housing with respect to the pandemic. So people are spending more time at home. That probably will translate into more babies uh, several months from now. Uh, it will also translate into more divorces because sometimes there is such a thing as too much togetherness. Um, sadly, we know that there is uh, significant mortality from COVID, both directly and indirectly. People are not getting medical treatment for other things that, that they need. And um, I, I expect that our excess mortality as compared to last year is going to be very high deaths lead to uh, estate sales. So that will bring some, um, some inventory into the market. Uh, as I mentioned, people will move from uh, denser areas into more suburban and rural areas, at least in the short term, we'll see. We did have kind of a trend going the other way where people were seeking more pedestrian settings. So interesting competing um, social pressures there. Um, we will definitely be seeing an increasing number of foreclosures and short sales in the year to come. There's been moratoriums on evictions and um, on foreclosures, particularly with uh, federally subsidized mortgage products or, or federally backed mortgage products. Those um, those moratoriums will end and um, we're going to see more distressed properties. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to jump through this because I know I'm going to run out of time and I wanted to hit on the AI stuff a little bit since we, we build that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, I've had the privilege of doing some work with uh, FAU on artificial intelligence and it's been a lot of fun. One of the things Bob mentioned were all the sensors and, and AI being built, in, built into commercial properties. In 1995, I was writing business plans on home automation and we thought it would be adopted within a couple of years and homes were built with lots of Cat5 wiring the adoption has really just started in the last couple of years on a widespread basis. And it's because it's cheaper, it's more accessible, um, the technology is much simpler, Wi-Fi makes everything easy, people have smartphones in their pockets. So adoption took an extra 20 years. I think the adoption rate on technology is accelerating and you're going to see lots more innovation in uh, newer home products. Um, you're going to see uh, lots of shifts in um, the, the way people work, the way people commute, um, and uh, simple things. We can go to the next slide. We, uh, we talk, I, and I don't know if I put it on here, but I want to cover this. We talk about uh, autonomous vehicles a lot, and they are coming, and lots of people have Teslas, probably a few in the audience. As vehicles become more automated, there will be less of a demand for parking. There we go. Thank you. Um, I attended an event where we were discussing the impact of uh, autonomous vehicles on urban planning and 30% of a city is uh, dedicated to parking, roughly 30%. Well, if we're doing more ride sharing, uh, autonomous vehicles, if it just becomes much more practical for people not to own a vehicle, you're going to see big changes in the way cities and residential structures are planned. Um, some of the things that we never gave a moment's thought to are three-dimensional planning. So we're going to see automated 
deliveries. You know, everybody's getting packages from Amazon all the time now. We're not going to the store. Uh, think about this. Amazon is working on having drone deliveries. Well, as this scales up, you're going to have air traffic in three direction in three dimensions. Right now, we only have deliveries in really two dimensions, right? They're ground level. That's changing. And it will change, I would predict, within the next decade. Um, and, and that will affect how we do things. At some point, we'll have three-dimensional, uh, I would suspect, traffic as we, uh, we get vehicles off the ground. But that's, that's a topic maybe for another day. Um, we, can, we can go to the next slide. Oh, was that it? Go back. I'm sorry, go back to, yeah, there we go. So in terms of AI and uh, residential real estate, anywhere where there are big bodies of data, you can train a model to help make decisions and to see patterns that humans just simply don't have the hours to identify. So in any of these aspects, all the way through the value chain, from site selection, all the way through marketing and sales, Artificial intelligence is already being implemented to some degree and will be implemented to an increasing degree to chew through data and find efficiencies and profit margins and value adds to the process. I think I've probably used my time. Anybody on the meter there? So uh, with that, I guess Bob and I can uh, enter into Q&A. Well, the, the only thing I was going to add about Amazon, for example, they're, they're going into malls now that are closed and they're trying to turn like abandoned stores into fulfillment centers. They're closer to the neighborhoods and it's an alternative use. And that's one of the things that you're starting to see more and more of is, is this alternative use. What are they doing? Housing. Um, there, there's all different things, but the latest is, is this Amazon. I know there's two big Amazon requirements in South Florida now looking for uh, additional fulfillment centers, but the one about the malls is just uh, new. And when you mentioned it, I thought it was an interesting point to bring up here. Yeah, absolutely. Simon Malls, I understand, is talking with Amazon and, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation about them and or Amazon taking over some of the big retailers like JCPenney and utilizing that space for uh, warehousing and distribution. Um, there's also a big move, Bob, and you, you can speak to this better than I, about uh, the transformation of retail um, and office into mixed use where, where there's residential housing uh, in a space in addition to entertainment, shopping, you know, pedestrian venues. So we're going to see these, I think some of these malls and even strip centers transformed and repurposed. That, that's been a buzzword for a while. It's been live, work, and play. Live, work, and play. You don't have to get out of your car. You park once and you can walk to stores. You can be entertained. You can go to the office and have everything under one roof, right in one place, and you're there. Yeah, I, I think that will continue to, to be the case. and a lot of these properties that are now suffering, you know, the, the math is better on investing. And started. Excellent, well, thank you both. I wanna bring in a few of the questions that we've gotten throughout this. Um, so this one struck me as especially relevant for this group um, because it directly ties into um, a university community, so whether it's Washington University or a different um, university, what do you think in terms of the market for undergraduate off-campus rentals and how will that change in the face of COVID? Um, any predictions for the residential sales market next spring, um, especially in light of that question? I, I guess I should grab that, Bob. Um, Please. So I happen to live right by Florida Atlantic University and I can tell you the demand Despite the fact that the university is really staggering its, um, its in-person physical attendance, the demand is very high for uni uh, off-campus university housing. And part of that is probably, I think the university has restricted their inventory because they don't want people living on top of one another. 
but would you want your student living on top of three other roommates in the middle of a pandemic? It doesn't make sense. So people are seeking uh, more spread out housing and there's a lot of demand for it right now. Um, you know, some of the university models are a little bit in question as people get to learn more and more um, offline. I'm sure WashU is addressing this. There's value to the institution, but people are getting educated without having a physical presence at the university much of their time. In terms of the housing market, what was the second question? The housing market next year? Yeah, this, sorry, predictions for the residential sales market next spring. <laughs> Very specific. Well, I'm gonna preface by saying my crystal balls as cloudy as anybody else's. <laughs> From what I see from here, I would anticipate some of the pressure will come off the market if if some of the the um, more negative factors in the economy come to bear on the economy, which would held them back. I I don't know how we can recover seamlessly from where we are now without experiencing a dip first. If we experience that dip, hopefully it won't be too severe, but I do think we are going to see an increase in um, inventory and distressed properties. So the buying could be better next year than it is right now. That's in my sense. Yeah. And Bob, I know that you mentioned that you don't think that offices are going away, um, but also that real estate is a lagging indicator. Um, so do you think we're headed for a collapse of the commercial market and what would be the signs to look out for? I don't, I don't necessarily think we're gonna see a collapse, but some of the things we're keeping uh, our eye on are um, mortgage defaults for some of the buildings, also tenant defaults. I mean, in our portfolio, we deal with a lot of institutional ownership properties and, and it's a little heavily weighted towards industrial. So we didn't experience as many defaults as perhaps a portfolio that was more oriented towards retail. Uh, so, you know, we're watching tenant defaults, we're watching mortgage defaults. Uh, you know, we, we all keep seeing the jobless claims rising every week, unemployment numbers. You know, there's a lot of different leading indicators that we're watching, but I don't expect a collapse, but you know, like they always say, patient money gets rewarded. People that, people that are in a hurry and, and are desperate and are, are under the gun need to make rash decisions may not always make the best one because you, you make money on the buy side, it's more mm -hmm. the sell side. If you don't buy something right and you don't have an exit strategy, it's hard to make that investment work out. Yeah, so on the note of industrial, um, we had a question that came in during this about that um, in terms of rents going up and supply keeping up with the demand. And then also what locations in South Florida do you think are prime for industrial development? That's, that's an interesting one because I'm working on a couple of good size industrial deals right now. And several properties are under development and, uh, and under construction around the airport, 595 and 95, I think no matter what city, if you're near an airport, that's usually a good spot to be for industrial. So whether it's Miami, um, Fort Lauderdale, or PBI, I think if you're near the airport, that's probably made sense. Secondary, you wanna be accessible to the roads. Sometimes rail spurs, depending upon what kind of materials or, or tenants you're targeting. And then also the ports. So you, know, you wanna be near transportation hubs. Right now, the problem is land prices are so expensive. So if you're looking for a, a good development opportunity and you wanna have a prime site, land costs are gonna drive up the rents and you may not be able to deliver something that's affordable. So there, there's some challenges. I mean, right now, vacancy rates for industrial are holding pretty strong. We're in single digits. And it's not easy to get the kind of concessions you would expect or hope to get in light of a pandemic and, and the challenges we're seeing. So of all the different sectors in commercial real estate, industrial is probably the strongest. And especially down here, you've been reading a lot about the last mile, all these companies coming in and the fulfillment and the retail, they're gobbling up space left and right. 
I'm working with a Fortune 50 company right now that's looking for a major warehouse for their materials. And we're working with a national auto parts supplier that's publicly traded, also looking for stuff. And most of the landlords are telling us, you know, that they have a multiple number of different prospects looking at the spaces. And, you know, they're not, they're not trying to be a used car salesperson. They're trying to show you that the markets remain active and, and there's a lot of, a competition still on the industrial side and rents are not going where I expected them to be and unfortunately in South Florida it's double digits for industrial space and that doesn't work for a lot of companies so you know if you're a, distrib a distributor you know historically you might have been up in Tennessee or north of here you're only in Florida if you absolutely have to be here because of proximity and turnaround times and, and, and that kind of stuff so Florida has remained strong. Institutions are coming in. There's so much money. They're overpaying for deals, and each deal is a new record. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Bob. You mentioned that. I, I was working with a, a building supplies distributor uh, from the Northeast, and they decided to migrate operations here to South Florida. Um, they own properties in Connecticut, D.C. area, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a breeze, right? It'll, it'll seem reasonable here. They had sticker shock. Uh, the pricing here was was much higher than what they were accustomed to along the seaboard. So um, I think one of the things that happened here, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that um, we we had a bias toward residential value. You know, the resident uh, real estate tends to go, go toward highest and best use. A lot of demand for residential, so there wasn't a lot of zoning for industrial and probably on a comparative basis, the size of our metropolitan area, um, we don't have that much industrial property available. Thanks. What do you think? We definitely don't, and it, it, it is a problem with rates because we're surrounded by water on three sides. We don't have an infinite supply of land, and that's gonna drive up the prices of the land and even though interest rates might be down, construction pricing is expensive right now. And, you know, we're in hurricane season and, you know, a lot of other factors which come into play. And we also have a pandemic going on. So there are a lot of opposing forces. You know, I was working on a transaction and we were looking at a new project down in Miami by the airport and, and they got hit with COVID. That was in the papers and that job site got shut down. And you, you only hear about certain ones that get reported. There's a lot of job sites where the workers come in, they are infected, but they don't shut down the job site. They just hush hush and send the worker home. Okay, well, we want to end with one last question. Um, and Kevin asked a really great question in the chat box, um, which is what will be the impact of short term rental demand, Airbnbs and others on residential price trends in the South Florida market? Will there be a correction due to change in investors in certain communities? A lot of that's uh, policy. As, as long as Airbnbs are legal and not zoned out, um, and, and there, is, you know, there is pressure from uh, neighborhood groups, from homeowners associations, from local municipalities uh, to impose restrictions on Airbnb, a really interesting phenomenon. I, I work with a couple of investors who uh, run Airbnb through their properties and they get a much higher rate of return on those properties than they could through other means of renting those properties or, you know, renting for longer durations. Um, so a lot of that's going to depend on, on how, how the, uh, you know, the legislature and local ordinances and community groups treat those uh, those properties. Um, they certainly, you know, everything is a function of revenue when you look at investment property. So if they're widely used, one would think that it would actually increase the value of the properties if they're being valued on a on an income based approach. I hope I hope that answered the question. I, I saw a bunch of questions came in, I think going to run out of time before we run out of questions but absolutely i will welcome 
you know, emails um, or phone calls if anybody wants to discuss further. I think Bob, Bob was open as well. Excellent. Well, I think um, while we do have a number of questions that have come in that we didn't have a chance to get to, unfortunately, um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up being very conscious of everybody's time. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone who joined us today for joining. We're really glad that you were able to attend and a special thanks, Bob and Scott, to both of you um, for participating in today's event and providing such a really great discussion and wonderful information. I have no doubt that um, with your generosity and offering your contact information, you'll get lots of follow-up um, from those whose questions we didn't get to, as well as others who are just really interested as I know I was. Um, so thank you both. Um, and to everybody, please visit the WashU Virtual Connections webpage for more virtual events being offered to all of us as alumni, parents, and friends. We hope that you have a great rest of your day and that you really enjoyed this. Um, it was wonderful to be able to be a part of this. Um, and I know as well that um, the link for the additional virtual events was just sent in the group chat. So before you close out, you might want to go ahead and just click on that. You'll get a survey email as well, and that will have contact information for both Bob and Scott. Um, so again, thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.